Welcome to 3ABN's Camp Meeting 2014, The Second Coming, an in-depth look. Wow, well, we're just so happy to invite you to join with us as we begin the Sabbath here in West Frankfort, Illinois. We're at the beautiful worship center, 3ABN, has, was, has been built by you, those of you that support this ministry. And we've just been praising God here since Wednesday night. It's been a tremendous time, hasn't it? This is meeting number 15, if you can believe it or not. Wow. And we still have a full day to go. And each sermon has been powerful and pointed and very practical. And the music has been really, really wonderful. Yes. This has been a great camp meeting. And were we to stop just now, I think it would be one of our best. But we've got one more full day to go and a lot of blessings in store. Wow. And we just are looking forward to this whole weekend. And every single message has been anointed. Uh, we have felt the power of the Holy Spirit here. Uh, when we've been in the back praying with the speakers, uh, it, it's just amazing. Uh, I, l I heard from Lonnie Malashenko today. He called me uh, back to tell me what a blessing it was for him to be here with this congregation. And he was at uh, pick picking out some flowers for uh, the uh, service they will have for his father uh, when he called me. So keep the Meloshenko family uh, in your prayers. And, you know, Jim, uh, I, met, I met Colin and Judy. They are from England, okay. and they came all the way over just for this camp meeting. I don't know where they are seated, but um, Colin okay, they're said right they're right down front all that right. Three Ben was instrumental in his coming back to the Lord, Amen. coming back to the church, and so he came to be with us. So Colin and Judy, you've come a yeah. long way. God bless you both. Right, and uh, we're, we're so happy that you're here. And we want to hear more about your story sometime because I know you were able to share some of it with Danny and he was real excited uh, when he heard about your story. So God bless you and we're, again, welcome uh, to Illinois. Well, listen, our brother John's going to sing. Indeed, he's going to be singing, Your Grace Amazes Me. And then, of course, our speaker is Ty Gibson. All right. And you, we know Ty. Uh, we all know that he's the co-director along with James Rafferty. Uh, of a fantastic ministry. Uh, what's the title of that ministry? Light Bearers Ministry. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's so tremendous, I forgot the title. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it, uh, he's also very active here on 3ABN. And we enjoy uh, so much being with, with James and Ty. They are wonderful men. They love the Lord Jesus with all of their hearts, but they're real people, mm -hmm. real people who enjoy life, enjoy. You heard uh, this morning when, uh, when uh, Ty was telling a little bit about how he got James involved with romance, and uh, <laughs> it, it, that's, that's uh, how much these guys have a great relationship. They really do. And, uh, I wish some of us, more of us, had better relationships with each other. But uh, it would be. What are you trying to say, Gilly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I tell people, uh, we, we have the same father, just, just a different mother. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay. John, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My faithful Father, enduring friend, your tender mercies like a river with no wind, it overwhelms me. covers my sin each time I come into 
still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery each day. I fall on my knees. Your grace still amazes me. Your grace still amazes me. Oh, patient Savior, you make me whole. You are the author and the healer of my soul. What can I give you? Lord, what can I say? I know there's no way to repay you, only to offer you my praise. Your grace still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery each day. I fall on my knees. Your grace still amazes me. Your grace still amazes me. It's deeper, it's wider, it's stronger, it's higher, it's deeper, it's wider, it's stronger, and it's higher than it. My eyes can see your grace still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery each day. I fall on my knees. Your grace. Still amazes me, your grace still amazes me. It before and I'll say it again, I'd be willing to max out a credit card and pay monthly payments with 15% interest till the second coming to sing like that, brother. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm so glad to be here at... Wait a minute. <laughs> For the life of me, I can't remember the name of this ministry. Hold on just a minute. Jim, what's the name of your ministry? The Hope, the Hope Channel. That's right. That's right. That's right. The fact is, I'm very happy to be here at 3ABN. Mostly because of you and secondarily because of Jim. I've been given the privilege of speaking on an amazing subject, 
You saw the title, didn't you? The people he's coming for. Now, I want to clarify, I wish the title of this message was The People for Whom He's Coming. But I'm not going to get into the grammar of the preposition at the end of the sentence. (laughs) What I'm going to do is begin with a thesis statement right after we offer a word of prayer. Father in heaven, you are so incredible. The closer we get to you, the more our hearts race. We are literally excited by the prospect that soon and very soon we will have the privilege of standing in your immediate presence. What grace, what love, what acceptance we will see in your eyes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to know you and to prepare for the soon coming of your son who will usher us into your presence. Please, Father, right now, give me clarity. Help me to speak effectively on your behalf. May all my brothers and sisters here and those who are viewing be blessed by the breaking of the bread of life. In Jesus' name, amen. So my opening thesis statement is simply this. Listen very carefully. We're going to go in a direction that might be a little bit unexpected on a topic such as ours. Thesis statement. The second coming of Jesus is a matrimonial event. The second coming of Jesus is a matrimonial event. Now, we have oftentimes specialized in reducing the glorious biblical truth of the second advent to a negation argument to proclaim what it's not. In other words, we have often reduced the second coming to simply a doctrinal argument regarding the fact that it's not a secret rapture and amassing the arsenal of texts from Scripture to point by point demonstrate that fact. Now, it's important for us to understand the manner of the second coming of Jesus But listen very carefully now, not at the expense of understanding why he's coming. The truth of the second advent of Christ is a positive biblical declaration. In order for us to construct our argument against the secret rapture, we have to pull various Bible verses, and it's a sound argument, in order to, piece by piece, line by line, prove our point against what we know to be a false doctrine. But the fact is, if we focus on what it's not to the exclusion of what it is, our hearts are robbed of the anticipation of a beautiful event that ought to have our hearts racing and palpitating with excitement for the prospect of Jesus coming back in our lifetime. Now, I've stated that the second coming is a matrimonial event. Let me wrap additional language around this so you know exactly where I'm coming from as we formulate the message tonight. The second coming of Jesus is the consummation of a great love story. It's that climactic point, the crescendo point of the ages. When human hearts that have been knit together in deep love for the Savior finally stand in His presence and feel the affirmation of a bride before her groom. Jesus is looking to form a corporate bride to be prepared for his coming. So the short answer to the question regarding the people for whom Jesus is coming 
is simply this. He's coming for a bride. He's coming for a group of people, a corporate body, who are head over heels in love with him. He's coming for a people whose hearts have been growing and swelling with excitement for who he is as the divine lover of our souls to the point that when he comes, he will look into our eyes and there will be resonance. He will see our acceptance of him, our love for him returning to his heart. And what joy Jesus himself will experience to be in the presence of those who love him like that. Now, in order to get into the meat of this message tonight, I want you to begin with me by allowing Scripture to paint for us a picture of God's matrimonial aspirations, beginning with the Song of Solomon. No better place to begin. Song of Solomon is one of those books of the Bible, one of a very few, one of three, that were under debate during the period of time when the canon of Scripture was being composed that gave us the 66 books. We almost ended up with just 65 because there were many scholars who are arguing against Song of Solomon being included in Scripture. They just couldn't understand why the Holy Spirit would inspire a love song such as this. And so, scholars were arguing against Song of Solomon being included in Scripture. Praise God that scholars who understood the depth of God's love for the human soul won out in that argument, and now we have the privilege of having this sacred text at our disposal, and we need to remember something about it. Song of Solomon is a part of Scripture. Because of this, we understand that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. We understand, according to Peter, that holy men of old spoke as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. So yes, Solomon composed his book, the book that bears his name. Solomon composed it, but he composed it like all the other prophets, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's fingerprints are all over this love song. When we come to Song of Solomon, we see a basic pattern that develops. This is a song about a love relationship between Solomon and his girl. She's called the Shulamite. Solomon loves her and expresses through various poetic means his love for her. She responds in the song by expressing her love back to him. And it's just this beautiful lyrical cadence back and forth. I love you. No, I love you more. You're beautiful beyond anything I've ever encountered in this. No, you are altogether lovely. Back and forth, back and forth. Some of the most beautiful lines, not just in Scripture, but in all of literature are found in the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. For example, at one point, the woman, the Shulamite, looks at Solomon and she says, your eyes are pools of understanding. You get me. You understand me, Solomon. And I'm affirmed in the fact that when I look into your eyes, I feel understood. Another line that's incredible in Song of Solomon is when the Shulamite, the woman, says to Solomon, you are my lover and my friend. In other words, Solomon, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, understood that the pinnacle of love is friendship, mutuality, reciprocation. The pinnacle of love is when the person your heart is reaching out to, you sense, is reaching back into your heart. It's the most amazing thing in the world to fall in love with someone. It's incredible on a whole new level to realize they love you back. That's the beauty of the Song of Solomon. Now, this is incredible because as we move through this beautiful love song going back and forth, we come to the point in the song where God himself 
is introduced to us in chapter 8. Chapter 8 of Song of Solomon, coming to the last chapter. Don't miss this. This is the part you've probably heard in weddings. Verse 6, notice, and I'm going to read it in the New King James Version, and I'm going to call your attention to a poor translation in most versions and give you something here that I think will be a blessing from the text. Set me as a seal, verse 6, upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Pause right there. What is she basically saying? My heart, my arm. The interior of my being, my thinking and feeling process, and my deeds. This is an early developed mention of what we have later on in the book of Revelation of the seal of God in the forehead, the seal of God taking captive the hearts and minds of God's people. This is love that is being described here, not slavery, not servitude. This is, Solomon, you're in my heart, you're in my deeds. I live for you from the inside out. Set me as a seal. Fix me in your love. Solidify me. Bring me into a relationship with you that's immovable, that cannot be changed. Seal me in this relationship that we have. For love the text continues, is as strong as death. That's simply a poetic way of saying, I love you and you love me with a love that can't even be thwarted by death itself. I would rather die than stop loving you. That's what she's saying. There is no self-interest that could in any way compromise my love for you. And then... Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. That doesn't sound real nice, but literally what it means is that jealousy, that this quality of love that is exclusive, that jealousy is as tenacious, not cruel, in the sense that we understand the word cruelty today, but as tenacious as the grave. A person dies, they go into the grave, and nothing but the voice of God at the resurrection is bringing that person back to life. Death is tenacious in its grip on those who have fallen to it. I love you and you love me like that, Solomon. With that kind of love, with that strength of love, with a love that is stronger than death and more tenacious than the grave. Then notice the language of passion. Its flames are flames of fire. The flames of fire. What, what's being described here? This love between us. There's, there's, there's a fire in my heart for you. There's passion for you, Solomon, and Solomon to the Shulamite. There's a living, thriving, energy-emitting kind of love in my heart for you and in yours for me. Notice this now. Here's the point. It's flames are flames of fire, my version, a most vehement flame. Now, it's there that the translators have gone all wrong because they didn't know what to do with this in the original language. So they said, huh, we're just going to go ahead and translate this vehement because we think it's simply conveying the idea of strength. But here's what it literally says in the Hebrew. It's flames, that is the flames of love, are flames of fire, the very fire of Yahweh himself. And there, for the one and only time in the song, God is brought into the picture. Essentially, what Solomon has ingeniously crafted for us is a love song in which he has created a sense of how powerful and beautiful the love is that can exist in its ideal form between a man and a woman in marriage. Not love as we've experienced it necessarily if we've had broken love relationships. When God speaks in matrimonial terms to you and me, don't do an immediate crossover into whatever pain you may have experienced. But you know if you've ever been married, if you said yes 
to marriage vows, you know that whatever brokenness may have befallen you afterwards, that you married because of what you knew in your heart marriage ought to be. The ideal of marriage, right? And because you know in your heart what it ought to be, you can resonate with what's being described here. Regardless of whatever pain or brokenness we've experienced, the fact is that matrimonial love at its zenith, at its pinnacle, in all its beauty, is the most incredible thing two human beings can ever experience in this life. And here, we're told by Solomon that this love is like the very love of Yahweh himself. Then, verse 7, many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. Do you hear what's being said here? Love is, according to this text, the absolute most precious, most valuable thing that any human being can ever experience. And in its purest form, that love that we know we were made for exists in the heart of God. As Solomon comes to the conclusion, he does something ingenious that is lost upon us unless we look at the text very carefully, and that is this. Solomon is the male lover in the song. Shulamite is the female. Amazingly, Solomon is the male name that is shalom, peace, well-being, an overall sense of composure and happiness and joy all bundled up into one. Peace, shalom, that's the name of the man in the love story. Shulamite is the female pronoun. It's the female name for peace. Shalom and shalom have fallen in love. And we come to the point in verse 10 where the Shulamite says, I am a wall and my breasts are like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who found shalom, peace. This is the point of resolve. This is what it was all moving toward. The whole trajectory of this relationship was that the man and the woman, Solomon and Shulamite, Shalom and Shalom, would together in their love find Shalom. They would find complete satisfaction in one another's love. When we look at the biblical narrative as it unfolds over and over again, God introduces himself in matrimonial terms. He wants us to view him as a lover in pursuit of his beloved. Turn now in your Bible to Ezekiel 16. Anybody who has any familiarity with me at all uh, is familiar with my love for this passage. If you've encountered it before in my preaching, so what? That's okay. <laughs> You're about to see it again. All right. Ezekiel chapter 16, in verses 4 through 8, we have a microcosm of the plan of salvation in the form of a story. The whole plan of salvation is encapsulated in verses 4 through 8. And God here, Yahweh, the almighty creator of heaven and earth, he is telling a story to you and me. As for your nativity... And the day of your birth, on the day that you were born, I'm in verse 4, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water, or no one cleansed you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor were you wrapped in swaddling clothes. Look at verse 5. No eye pitied you. Another version says, no one loved you on the day of your birth. No one loved you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown into an open field. This is God telling you and me a story. And he says, on the day that you were born, of course, locally, historically, this is God telling a story about Israel. On the larger scale, the microcosm in its macro manifestation is a story about all of humanity, 
You and I, from birth, are, as it were, abandoned babies that nobody loves. That is to say, no matter what mother, father, brothers, sisters you happen to have, whether they be good familial relationships or negative ones, the fact is that in this broken world, nobody can love you in the way, to the degree, with the quality of love with which your heart longs to be loved. God alone has that gift of love to bestow upon you. And God says that your condition as a sinner is characterized by the fact that you are born into abandonment. You are born into abandonment, and he says, no one loved you. This is amazing. No one loved you. You were thrown, verse 5, into an open field. Look at this, verse 6. And when I passed you by, I saw you struggling in your blood, in your own blood. Can you picture it? An abandoned baby, torn from the womb, the umbilical cord not properly, caringly cut, the blood of birth still in the flesh of this infant, yanked from the womb and thrown off the side of the road into an open field. And God says, I was passing by and I saw you struggling in your blood. I saw you dying. And that he says, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. That's verse 6. God is speaking into our broken, damaged, wounded, fallen condition of lovelessness. And he says to you and me, I want you to survive this. I want you to live. I don't want you to be overcome and succumb to death. I want to give you the gift of eternal life and salvation. And so how's he going to do it? Verse 7, so I made you to thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew and you matured. Hold on to that. You grew and you matured, and you became very beautiful. This is God speaking to you and me. This finds parallel in Paul, where Paul describes that God is in the process of forming a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The plan of salvation isn't merely about getting you and me out of hell into heaven, out of trouble into the good place. The plan of salvation is about something more than that. According to Scripture, the plan of salvation right here in this incredible text, the plan of salvation is a beautification process. God is looking into your brokenness and mine, and he says, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. I'm going to restore to you the beauty of character and personality that I created you for. You're going to grow up and mature, he says, into a very beautiful woman in the corporate sense. Men, don't take it personal. You're going to grow up and mature into a beautiful woman. God wants you and me to be beautiful. I want to tell you something in passing here. Yes, God loves you. He loves me with agape love in the New Testament, which is unilateral love. It's one-way love. It's I love you regardless of what's going on with you because I am love. And you can't alter the fact that I love you. That's agape love. It's one way. It's unilateral. But it looks for reciprocation. God loves you and me unconditionally, but that unconditional unilateral agape love, God lavishes upon our heart for the purpose of stimulating a response. He wants us to look back into his eyes and say something like, I love you too. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. That's the circuit of beneficence, to use the words of the book Desire of Ages. That's the circle. That's the love of God going out and down, and then he smiles because it comes out and up to him from our hearts. 
This scripture says God is in the process of beautifying us. You became beautiful. Then look at this, verse 8. This is amazing. When I passed you by again, you've been going through a maturation process. When I passed you by again and I looked upon you, indeed, my version says, your time was the time of love. Another version, I passed you by again and I saw that it was time for you to fall in love. She's grown up in verse 7. She's thriving. She's gone through puberty. Spiritually, the church has got to grow up. And as the church grows and matures in this beauty that God has planned for us, the bride of Christ is becoming ready for his second coming. I passed you by again, and I saw that it was time for you to fall in love. So I spread my wings over you, and I covered you. And watch this. Yes, I swore an oath to you. In the Hebrew, I entered into covenant with you. I made a covenant promise. I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. And notice this tender language from God in heaven, and you became mine. There is a natural and godly possessiveness to love. There is an exclusiveness to love. There is a forsaking all others for the one. And God is here delighting in the fact that his people grow up and mature to the point where he can look upon them and see beauty and say to them, you became mine. Now, when he says, your time was the time of love, I saw that it was time for you to fall in love. God is describing here preparation for marriage. She's finally ready. It's time for you to fall in love. I want to say to you from the bottom of my heart, I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to say to us as Seventh-day Adventists, it is time for us to fall in love with Jesus. It is time for us to grow up and mature beyond mere negation arguments and comparing ourselves among ourselves and assessing one another with downward gaze, with condemnation. It is time for us as a people to grow up spiritually, to become beautiful in God's eyes. It is time for you and me to fall in love with Jesus. Now quickly rush over to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2, and you'll see additional matrimonial language that is introduced to us to describe God's aspiration for you and me, preparatory to the consummation of the ages, the second coming of Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, again, the sin problem is described. Here, the sin problem is described as the people forgetting God. God says in Hosea, I loved you. I gave myself to you. We entered into marriage relationship with one another, but you forgot me. And you pursued other loves. You pursued other lovers. And as you pursued other loves, I realized that something needed to be done. So he says in verse 14 of chapter 2 of Hosea, Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak comfort to her. That is, I will speak words of love to her in the Hebrew, in some versions as well. God is saying here that he is going to save you and me by alluring us to him by putting on display before us the beauty, the irresistible beauty of his love for us. I'm going to allure you to me. I'm going to take you into a quiet place alone, and I'm going to speak words of love to you. Now watch what happens. This is the ultimate paradigm shift in verse 16. And it shall be in that day. Pause. What day? In the day when I allure my people to myself. 
when I capture their attention and pull them away from the idols of this world, from the other lovers that they have been pursuing, when I finally arrest the attention of my people and allure them to me, verse 16, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband. And you will no longer call me my master. Here God is drawing a contrast between two kinds or qualities of relationship. There is on the one hand the servant-master relationship and God looks upon that kind of dynamic and he pushes back on it. He essentially says, I don't want that between you and I. I don't want you to be my servant in the slave sense there's another sense in which Scripture does use the word servant in a positive sense. Paul talks about being a willing captive to the heart of God. But that's very similar to a man and a woman falling in love and entering into an exclusive relationship in which I give myself to you voluntarily. It's still not coercion or manipulation. But here, the servant-master dynamic is negated in favor of a husband-wife, a bridegroom dynamic. God says that when you finally see me for who I am, when your attention is drawn to me and you are allured to me, you see my love for you, in that day you will stop relating to me as a servant to a master and you will begin relating to me on a whole new premise. You won't say anymore, my master. You'll say, oh, my husband. There are two different dynamics described here. This is where God is leading his people. And then he drops to his knees in verse 19. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice in loving kindness and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you will know the Lord. This is so incredible that God would speak to you and me like this. This tells us that he is aiming for something beautiful and high and glorious and wonderful in the relationship between ourselves and him. And I want you to notice that the weight of the focus is on His love and mercy and righteousness and faithfulness to us. That's the nature of the biblical covenant between God and His people. Salvation is premised upon God's promises to us, not ours to Him. God's love for you and me, not our ratcheted up, disciplined love for him. It is impossible for the human heart, if left to itself, to bring about the kind of love that is described in Scripture. We need a Savior. We need one who is unswervingly faithful to us in the face of our rebellion and unfaithfulness to finally get our attention so that as we run from him into the arms of other lovers, finally our hearts are broken by the fact that he has never stopped loving us. And so covenantal love in Scripture is God's promise of faithfulness to you and me. And that love reaching into our hearts produces a returning current of love to complete the circle of beneficence. We don't initiate the circle with our faithfulness. You will continue, I will continue to be weak and impotent and crippled in our spiritual experience precisely to the degree that we emphasize the human part of the equation. To the degree that we focus on, preach about, and communicate what we ought to do, must do, ought not to do, ought not to do, should not do. To the degree that we focus on the human part of the equation. Not that there isn't a human part. 
There is. But the human part is utterly and completely dependent on the divine part. Amen. You've seen these pictures, haven't you, of massive icebergs jutting up out of the ocean, larger than any building in any skyscraper city. And then your eyes drop down in the photo to see that what you thought was massive was just the tip of the iceberg, and there is this massive ice structure that is beneath the surface of what we see. The objective love of God for you and me, His faithfulness is that massive structure beneath the surface that gives rise to this tip of the iceberg that we tend to want to focus on and specialize in. To the degree that we focus on what we had better do, ought to do, should do, we will be spiritually weak and impotent. But the more you focus on the heart of Jesus toward you, the more you'll find yourself experiencing a kind and quality of love for Him that you never thought was possible. Your experience will begin to be built upon His promises, not yours, which Ellen White in Steps of Christ says of those promises that they are like ropes of sand. The promises of human beings to God. But God's faithfulness is the point of the covenant. He drops to one knee here and is proposing to you and me. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. That's how I'll relate to you. And I'll relate to you, he says, with faithfulness. And you shall know the Lord. You'll know me when you get a glimpse of my faithfulness toward you. Then you'll begin to know me as a husband rather than a master. And the whole tenor and quality of your spiritual experience will be radically changed. You will find yourself loving the things that God loves and hating the things that God hates. You'll find yourself saying things like, I do always those things that please Him. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. I delight to do your will, oh my God, because your law is in my heart. Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Yes, I will observe it with my whole heart. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my heart for you, O oh God, for the living God. When will you come to me? You'll begin to identify with the language of love that is pervasive in Scripture. Language that at one point in your experience was foreign to you. You just passed over it. You didn't even know what to do with it. You didn't relate to that language. You're like, what does that mean? I don't get that. I don't feel that. I don't experience that. You will. You will when you shift the weight of your focus and dependence upon the covenant faithfulness of God in the plan of salvation through which he gave his son at Calvary to die for you and me, and the vision of that love will radically change the quality of your experience with God. Now, the Old Testament is pervasive with this kind of matrimonial language. God is a pursuing lover. It's not surprising then that when we come to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John in chapter 3, and verse 29, to just give you a hint of where we're going, you should be turning there now. John chapter 3 and verse 29, it shouldn't be surprising to us then that when Jesus comes into the world, when he steps out of eternity into time, when Jesus comes up close and personal into our world, John the Baptist sees him and points to him, and he says, uh, he's... And then he tells us who he is. John's followers were saying, wait a minute, who is this guy who's come out of nowhere here? We're followers of you, John the baptizer. And John says, uh, wait a minute, let me clarify something here. Verse 29 of John 3, he who has the bride, or he to whom the bride belongs, is the bridegroom. But the friend, that is in our culture, the best man, 
The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete. John essentially says, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce you to your groom. He essentially says, Jesus has now come to this world to claim his bride. The Gospel of John then unfolds with a kind of wooing process. It unfolds like a tryst, like a beautiful interaction between Jesus and one person after another. From every angle possible, people are getting a glimpse of his goodness and his love. And then we come to chapter 14, the great second coming passage of the New Testament. And there, Jesus says to his disciples, verse 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Notice this. In my Father's house are many mansions. More accurate translation, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, yes, I'm leaving. I go to prepare a place for you. But if I go to prepare a place for you, I will Come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus, who was introduced by the baptizer as the groom who has come for his bride, is now invoking the local cultural language of the times regarding matrimony. In that culture, a man would see a woman over the vegetable stand or at the well. And he would say, she's the one. I hope she feels the same way. And he will go through a wooing process, getting to know her. And if that love begins to reciprocate, and they begin to understand that, hey, this is mutual. Not only do I love you, but you love me. Then at that point, the man in that culture would say, okay, it's settled. The proposal is made. The date is set. I'm going away. I'm going to go to my father's house, and I'm going to prepare the matrimonial room, our new home. I'm going to prepare the place for you, my bride, but be sure of this. I'm coming back to get you as soon as the room is ready. And then he would go back, and he would get his bride. The marriage would take place, and he would take her to live forever for the rest of their lives with him in his father's house. Jesus is telling the story of his second advent in the exact narrative trajectory of the Old Testament here. When you come to chapter 17, he pulls that language up again. Chapter 17, you're going there quickly. Chapter 17, verse 3, and Jesus in verse 3 defines eternal life in the same terms that Hosea used in chapter 2 of Hosea. And this is eternal life, Jesus says, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent, that they might know you. Down in verse 20, notice the language. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And they, that they all may be one, watch this, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me. This is the language of the closest intimacy, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and watch this, have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. Jesus closes his public ministry, expressing the aspirations to be with us and for us to be with him. As we come to the book of Revelation, the second coming is depicted in chapter 19, again, with matrimonial language. 
Chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. Remember, the bride has been going through a maturation process, a beautification process of character and personality, growing in the love of her bridegroom. She's made herself ready. She's made herself ready. Verse 8, And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Do you see what's happened here? Jesus comes for a people. The people he's coming for. He's coming for a people, a corporate body like you and me, whose love has reached back to his love, whose faithfulness has reached back into his faithfulness. He's initiated the relationship. He's wooed us. He's cultivated a connection with us. We've moved through a trysting process. He's been romancing our hearts through Bible study and prayer. And as we have grown closer to him, and I urge you in the name of Jesus, that if what we're describing here does not approximate what you know to be your experience with Jesus, it is time for you to fall in love. It is time for you to begin to identify with the lover's heart that is the Savior of the world. Jesus is coming back for a people. He's coming back for you and me, a beautiful bride who has made herself ready, who loves him in return for his love, his faithful covenantal love for us. Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? Well, that's what it looks like. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Thank you for loving us the way you do. You're incredible in the extreme, Lord. We've not known any love like this. Even in the best relationships that we've ever had, we long for a love that is greater still. Our hearts were made for you. Prepare us, Lord, for the soon coming of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.